Hello, everybody, and greetings from Northampton, Massachusetts. I wish I could be with you today. I'm so glad that IHS is celebrating Louis' 100th birthday. It's almost as if he were there to enjoy this. Um, I'm going to share my screen and tell you the story of how I met Louis and what I would give him today if I could. Uh, and I hope you can see this. So the title of my talk is A Gift for Louis, The New Aperiodic Monotile. But I want to begin with telling you how I met Louis. And uh, that was a, a not at the Ottawa Congress, but as a result of it. So the International Congress of Crystallographers in Ottawa, uh, 1981, was for me a turning point uh, because I met a young metallurgist named Denis Gracias. <clears throat> and... Uh, I presented a poster on color symmetry, and his poster was next to mine. And when we had odd time, off times, we read each other's. And so then he read mine, and he said, ah, you have to meet Louis Michel. And I was nervous about that. I told him I had tried to read Louis's papers on symmetry and physics. But he wrote in a formal, abstract, take-no-prisoners mathematical language. And I, a mathematician knowledgeable about symmetry, could not get through the first paragraphs. So I was afraid of Lewis and didn't want to meet him. Uh, but Denny laughed and he said, no, no, he's nothing like that in person. So when I got home, <clears throat> I remembered that I, I belonged to uh, Smith College, where I taught mathematics, belongs to a five college consortium. And the five colleges committee on applied mathematics uh, had funds for visiting lectures. And I was a member of that committee. So I proposed uh, uh, that we invite Louis Michel to be uh, a visiting lecturer there. And my suggestion was accepted immediately. It was a committee of people from five different colleges, two maybe or so from each. And everybody was very enthusiastic because they all knew of Louis. They knew of his broad interest, his expertise and reputation. And everyone had a stake in the visit. So we agreed to invite him and we did. And Louis was appointed distinguished visiting professor of mathematical sciences at the five colleges. And this was a wonderful thing for all of us. And we're, we're grateful to this day that he was here. Uh, and that is how our friendship began. <clears throat> so Denis Grasses was right. Louis the person was not the distant, austere, formal uh, <clears throat> formal author of his papers. Uh, he, Louis the person was funny, he was lively, he was informal, and he was interested in everything. And so was Therese, his wife. And it was wonderful to get to know them and to have them there. Uh, they visited us many, many times. Louis also knew what he didn't know, and he was eager to learn from anyone who could teach him. And I think that's why he took an interest in us. So uh, he, in addition to visiting us, he invited each of us uh, to IHES. <coughs> uh, and that was wonderful experiences for all of us. Uh, he had worked with Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, and he and Therese were deeply impressed by the Bohr's hospitality and the close relations among the colleagues that they fostered and vowed to make their home and bureau a welcoming place. And they certainly succeeded. And uh, the Michelle's dinner parties, which seemed to be every night, it was not unusual to speak one language with the person on your left, and another with the person on your right, and a third with the person across the table. Therese was multilingual, ever alert, and rescued her befuddled guests. She spoke French, of course, English, of course, and Chinese and Hebrew, and I think a couple of other languages. So we were always saved by Therese. This is a picture in their kitchen where the meals were usually served. The usual gift to bring Louis, the gift that he most enjoyed, was an example of some curious phenomenon in mathematics and, uh, and physics, or a new result or a novel proof. So though it isn't really mine to give, my gift for Louis on his 100th birthday would be the curious novel and very new 13-sided poly polygonal uh, aperiodic monotile, also called a hat and an Einstein. Einstein meaning single stone. It, it should be two words there in German. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a very strange looking shape, uh, but it does have 13 sides if you count them. And it's, it's a polygon and believe it or not, it's a tile. What would Louis do with the aperiodic hat? Would he wear it? Uh, People did apparently wear hats like that back in the day. Would he eat it? Two days after the, this hat tiling was announced, uh, the, the cookie cut, print the code for for um, uh, 3D printing was 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 made available to everybody worldwide, and people made cookie cutters and began to cut the cookies out of the tiles and eat them. 
Uh, so you can play with these and then eat them. Let's go back. Uh, wait. Uh, and then the other possibility, which I'm sure Louis would do, is to set the, the tile in, in context. What is this? Uh, what is the special case of how can we understand it better? And here, that's what we did for several years. Peter Engel and I and Louis worked together on a project we called Lattice Geometry. And uh, we were going to publish his book. We never were able to do that. Uh, at the, by the time Louis died. And for, fortunately for all of us, Boris Zelinsky has done much of that. And, and he's already spoken to you about this. <clears throat> but there's, there are things in the preprint that are not in his book. And some of those, I think, would be relevant to this. So Louis always asks, what is this a special case of? Uh, when he learned that, for example, these are some examples that are in the, in, in the uh, lattice geometry book. When he learned that Conway and Sloan found an 11-dimensional lattice generated by a set S of shortest vectors, but with no lattice basis in S, he proved that this occurs in every dimension greater than 10. So this was just one of the first in a large infinite family, which Conway and Sloan themselves had not realized. Uh, when Louis learned that he had conjecture on lattice geometry that we've been trying to prove for, for several years, I could say, failed in dimension eight, he generalized it and defined new lattice invariants. So this was his way with a curious novel phenomenon was to ask what's a special case of and find that special case. So let's take a closer look at the hat. Uh, and we see that it is divided, it can be divided into eight pieces congruent to each other. And these are called kites by some people. So this is a, an octakite because there are eight of them. And where do they where where do they come from? They are they come from the hexagonal tiling <coughs> of the plane. Except that in this case we partition the hexagon not by drawing uh, radii from the center to the vertices, but to the midpoints of the edges. And then we partition each hexagon into uh, six kites. And these particular eight are the configuration joining together. The configuration called the hat. And here is the way it appeared in the New York Times, which gave it a full page. They were, there's so much, been so much excitement about this creature. Uh, and here you see the piece of the much larger piece of the tiling. All of these shapes are uh, are hats. Uh, a few are some of the dark blue are mirror images of the other, but that uh, that is uh, debatable whether people some people don't like that, other people don't care. Anyway, they're all the hats if you accept mirror images. And they're all, this is all situated in the hexagonal tiling, so you can see how it fits. And a reporter asked me about that, uh, and I was just amazed, I told her I was just amazed it was sitting right in the hexagons. You would think that a aperiodic tile would be a very strange, weird thing that never uh, had anything to do with classical crystallography, classical tiling theory, but here it is, it's just sitting right there. Uh, this, this is very, very new, as I said. The primary sources so far, March 20th, um, this year, David Smith, Joseph Myers, Craig Kaplan, and Chaim Goodman Strauss put uh, posted a, a paper they called an AA periodic monotile on archive, and it went viral. Um, and then a few weeks later, May 2nd, Joshua Sokolar, who has been involved in tiling theory for a very long time, physicist at Duke University, uh, published a, a posted, not published, quasi crystalline structure of the, of the Smith, this being the same Smith, monotile tilings. Uh, also on archive. And then there's also a lot of material found now on various websites, but nothing has been published in peer reviewed journal yet. However, it's being reviewed by peers all over the world and no one so far has found anything to object. Uh, so this is Smith, uh, <clears throat> Myers, uh, Kaplan and Goodman Strauss. What do they do? Um, they first prove that the hat tiles the plane. That You have to do that, that's not obvious. Uh, and if you cut these out, copies of the tiles, and play with them as I did, you find that you can begin to fill the plane, but you can't. There's no guarantee, uh, obvi no obvious guarantee that you can continue that and fill the entire plane. And there, are, of course, we know many tiles that you can tile finite regions, but yet still can't continue that. So there's no reason to believe that, but nevertheless, they were able to prove that. And then they give two different proofs uh, that the tilings are aperiodic. Um, one proof is modeled on the, the proof of aperiodicity for Penrose tilings, though it differs in some respects. And the second proof seems unlike any used before. So the Penrose tiles, you all have seen these and you know them very well. These, they're the two, this, I'm taking the, they come in several different forms, but the form I'm using here are two rhombuses. 
Um, this was 72 degree angle here, pi over uh, 2 pi over 5, two, here's 2 pi over 10. Um, and the um, notches uh, force you to, you have to, they're, they're called matching rules. They force you to assemble these in only a certain number of ways. And in particular, you cannot assemble them into a periodic pattern. So what you can do around a single vertex is do five of the so-called thick realms in two different ways and so forth and so on. And if you examine a patch of the Penrose tiling, the, the matching rules aren't shown here, but you can examine all the vertices and see that they are in fact always one of these various, the, these eight. Uh, so that's what the Penrose tiling is. And they've had tremendous uh, applications and, and inspirations in many fields, including in the crystallography. Uh, the thing about Penrose tiles and what they, how they were able to prove that they are in fact non-periodic is that in every Penrose tiling, we can group the ROMs into larger ROMs as shown here, the red ones. Um, and this is, and there's only one way to do this. In other words, they have a hierarchical structure. The Penrose tiling then contains within itself a another Penrose tiling on a larger scale. And those those larger, that larger scale tiling does the same thing. It contains another Penrose tiling on a skill larger scale. And I didn't continue to draw this in, but you can imagine how that goes, just like the red one. Uh, and so you have a blue, a larger scale, and then you can take that, of course, and do that again. And this goes on ad infinitum. And then from there, that's a not too difficult argument that the Penrose tilings are not periodic. Uh, and Smith and his colleagues showed that this is the same thing for the hats. And it's more sophisticated, a little differently, uh, handled a little differently. Um, but they showed that although hats cannot be grouped into bigger hats, they can be grouped uniquely into four different metatiles. And the metatiles here are shown here. They're four different polygonal shapes. And the, the hats fit into those more or less. Uh, so all of this is very much like the Penrose proof, not quite, but enough that it's convincing. Uh, the metatiles can be grouped uniquely into metatiles, not exactly the same shape, but of the same basic shape. And this converges uh, just as the in the other case. And so therefore, the hat is a periodic too. So the, the the paper, the original paper is 89 pages. This is, takes up half of it, uh, but I won't go into details here. Uh, Joshua Sokolar, uh, more recently, by uh, a few weeks after there, recast the hat tilings in the high uh, high dimensional cut and project framework that had been developed for Penrose and other aperiodic tiles. And he's calculated their diffraction patterns. And so here, his version of the meta tiles is shown here. And this is a picture of meta tiling. Um, and here is a diffraction pattern that Sokolar has uh, has uh, calculated. And you see it's hexagonal. It's not, uh, it, it's a classical crystallographic, um, but it is also, he's able to show that this is in fact not, not uh, uh, periodic. Uh, the second proof uses a process similar to zone contraction of zone tope families. And this is a classification of lattices that we studied uh, in lattice geometry. And Louis was very interested in it. But this doesn't fit that exactly because the hat is not a zonagon. Nevertheless, some of the ideas are similar. Um, the hat has eight edges of eight length one. Um, those are the brown edges shown here. This one, the longest one here, we think of it in this case as two short edges, the, the, equal, the equal length of these. These are all length one, 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 one. One 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 one, and it has six of length square root three, and uh, so what they do in the second proof is to l study the tiling as these different uh, edges shrink to zero and then expand back again. If you shrink the brown edges to zero, the tile contracts to this, which is a hexagon. Um, if you shrink the green edges to zero, the tile contracts to this, which is an octagon. And every tiling by the hat belongs to, this is what they showed, a continuum of tilings that includes one by tetriamons. The, these are tetriamons, meaning four, four tri, uh, equilateral triangles, and one by octiamons, which are eight equilateral triangles. But these are smaller than those. Uh, the area of this one, which is for the four, is actually three halves the area of this one. And this is a crucial point for their proof. So let's take a look um, at this process of the, this is Craig Kaplan's uh, video or animation. <laughs> so you see the edge, edges are shrinking. And then when it completes its shrinking, 
the green ones are gone. Now we're in the shape. This is the shape of the of, of the of the the octiamon, and now it's we're letting those increase again. They had just come back somewhere along in the middle here. You get the hat. Uh, as we continue this this uh, edge shrinking, we move over to the browns being zero, and now we have just the green edges, which are the, we get this tiling. So let's see if we can. Aha. Okay. Um, so that 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 you can play that. You can download that uh, from the internet easily. Craig has it up on his website, and you can download that and play with it and look at it. And you can freeze it and slow it down. And it's a very very good way to study the process of this proof. So what they're arguing is, um, if the hat tiling were periodic, um, the these two tilings would be also naturally, um, because as the edge edges shrink, the configurations don't change. What's next to what, and so on, remain the same. The clusters remain the same, and periodicity would be preserved. So if the hat were periodic, these tilings would be two. Um, but in that case, their lattices would be related by similarity. Now that takes some proving, but they do prove it. Uh, a similarity factor so that it would just be a scale factor. But the scale factor has to take into account the differences in the in their sizes. And in fact, it would require that the similarity be uh, have a scale factor of square root three over two. But in fact, that's impossible because all of these are based on hexagonal lattice and that becomes a contradiction. Uh, these are incommensurate with each other in that respect. So again, I'm skipping over the, the details here, by to say the least, but nevertheless, that is the argument. And so there we have uh, a proof uh, because this, the, this is an impossible thing, and therefore these can't be peri periodic. Um, now, what would Louis do with this? Louis would ask, how are these two proofs related? Uh, does each imply the other? Uh, is there a setting that includes them both? I like to think he would enjoy this birthday gift. And so I conclude just with my favorite picture of Louis and Therese, the adventure they made of life and their, their friendships and of intellectual activities and everything. Happy birthday to both of them. I wish they were here. And thank you all. Thank you very much and best wishes to everybody.